Hello guys, welcome to episode 2 of A Chat with Beasley, the video series where I bring a topic to the table that I find interesting, break it down, and chat it out with you. Today's topic is what happened during the 2016 presidential election. Were we hacked by Russia? This topic has interested me for a long time, and like many of you, I want to know what all the hubbub was about. It doesn't seem like you can turn on the TV without hearing Russia, Russia, Russia. And that became a concern to me. Did Russia really elect Donald Trump? Did they steal the election from Hillary Clinton? These questions and more will be discussed on today's episode of A Chat with Beasley. Okay, so in order to understand what a hack is, you need to understand the definition. What is hacking? Hacking, to use a computer to gain unauthorized access to data in a system. Quote, they hacked into the bank's computer, end quote. It's very important to know what hacking is going forward, as this word is often thrown around with very little regard for what it actually means when it comes to the 2016 election. Another form of gaining unauthorized information can come from a leak. And what is information leaking? A leak, an intentional disclosure of secret information. Quote, one of the employees was responsible for the leak, end quote. Enter WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is at the center of the Russian hacking story. WikiLeaks is a multinational media organization and associated library and was founded by its publisher Julian Assange in 2006. WikiLeaks specializes in the analysis and publication of large data sets of censored or otherwise restricted official materials involving war, spying, and corruption. It has so far published more than 10 million documents and associated analysis. WikiLeaks also has a history of excellence. With more than 11 years of publishing, they have been shown to never release a falsified document and have stood behind that pedigree to this day. On July 22, 2016, WikiLeaks published 19,252 leaked DNC documents. The DNC is the Democratic National Committee. It even says leaked in the Wikipedia on this story. These emails when viewed by the public expose many misdeeds and obvious collusion and corruption being perpetrated by the Democratic Party. These deeds seem to benefit one Democratic candidate, and that was Hillary Clinton. These emails shined a huge light on the way high-ranking DNC officials were building a narrative against the Democratic powerhouse Bernie Sanders, and even highlighting Sanders' faith in an apparent attempt to paint him as an atheist in order to turn off religious voters. These emails showed collusion with many mainstream media outlets, news anchors, and even high-ranking DNC officials. The backlash from the public getting a hold of this information caused such turmoil that the DNC head Debbie Wasserman Schultz and three other officials of the DNC stepped down after their corruption was exposed. During this time, Clinton's campaign manager Robbie Mook stated on ABC News that he believes the Russians were instrumental in it. Quote, Experts are telling us that Russian state actors broke into the DNC, took all these emails, and now are leaking them out through these websites. It's troubling that some experts are now telling us that this was done by the Russians for the purpose of helping Donald Trump, end quote. And this is the moment that I believe the Russian narrative was created. WikiLeaks went on to release another trove of extremely damaging emails from John Podesta, Clinton's campaign chairman, on October 7, 2016. As most are aware, WikiLeaks never releases doctored documents, and the revelations of the Podesta emails made the American public gawk with disgust as they read exactly what Podesta had in his closet. His emails included gems like this. Clinton had great relations with Wall Street and bankers. A June 2013 email showed a speech to Goldman Sachs that detailed Clinton's hope to, quote, intervene in Syria as covertly as possible, end quote, and that the U.S., quote, used to be much better at this than we are now, end quote. A November 2015 email chain between campaign staffers discussed planting a Wall Street speech in the media to give the impression that Clinton's speeches, quote, to all those fat cats, end quote, were nothing to worry about. Podesta emails even exposed Clinton's pay-to-play schemes. In a mail from February 2016, simply titled, quote, Speaking at the Banks, Nira Tandon, the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, suggests to John Podesta that Clinton, quote, 
should just return the money if she loses badly, end quote. Another email from Clinton aide Huma Abedin to Rabi Mook and John Podesta in January 2015 details how Moroccan authorities donated to the Clinton Foundation's Clinton Global Initiative to get access to Clinton. Abedin says the king has personally committed $12 million both for the endowment and to support the meeting, and that, quote, the condition upon which the Moroccans agreed to host the meeting was for her participation. If HRC was not part of it, the meeting was a non-starter, she said. She goes on to say that the meeting had been Clinton's idea. Quote, our office approached the Moroccans and they 100% believe that they are doing this at her request. She created this mess and she knows it, end quote. Some messages in the emails were also designed to give Clinton some cover. Politico's chief political correspondent, Glenn Thrush, sent his article to John Podesta to be approved prior to publishing. Quote, please don't share or tell anyone I did this, Thrush said. Podesta responded that there were, quote, no problems here, end quote. In an email exchange from June 30th, 2015, Brent Badowski, a columnist from The Hill, contacted Podesta regarding a piece he wrote, which he describes as being, quote, positive, carefully written, and designed to give her, Hillary Clinton, some cover with liberals, end quote. The emails also shown that Hillary Clinton's campaign thought Bernie Sanders was a doofus. Podesta messaged Nir Tandon in December 2015 regarding the Paris Climate Change Conference and referred to Bernie Sanders as a doofus for attacking the deal. Badowski criticized the Clinton campaign in a September 2015 email for allegedly giving Clinton surrogates talking points to attack Bernie. He instead recommended that the company, quote, make love to Bernie and his idealistic supporters and co-op as many of his progressive issues as possible, end quote. A mail to Podesta from Philip Mungner, a philanthropist known for his hefty donations to the Democratic Party, took an alternative approach. Mungner wrote, Clinton is, quote, going to have to kneecap him. She's going to have to take him down from his morally superior perch, end quote. Podesta's emails also shone a light on the bevy of media elites from virtually every news agency colluding with the Clinton campaign, donating to the Clinton initiative, and pledging support to the Clinton machine. This is why Donald Trump is under constant fire, in my opinion. This information from John Podesta, as well as a sick liking of hot dogs, pizza, pasta, and walnut sauce, which may have ties to potential child sex trafficking, have marred Podesta and are more than likely something he will never be able to recover from. With all this true information now in the hands of the voter, the Clinton campaign panicked and went full steam into Russia mode, and her loving media friends seemed more than happy to drive the narrative. So now, WikiLeaks and Donald Trump have been deemed spies and Russian agents by the Clinton campaign and, more importantly, the Clinton machine. And that's when the Russian floodgates open. Since this day, Trump has fought a bevy of assaults from the corporate media insinuating that he's been working with Vladimir Putin, that he's been instructed by Putin, that Putin installed Trump as a Russian operative, and even claims from partisan Democratic official Maxine Waters that Vladimir Putin may have even come up with the terms crooked Hillary and lock her up. The Russia claims began to take a life of their own with Trump's pick for national security advisor Michael Flynn. Here's what we know about Flynn and his connections to Russia. December 2015, Michael Flynn, a retired U.S. Lieutenant General, is paid more than $45,000 by state-sponsored broadcaster Russia Today to address the network's 10th anniversary gala in Moscow. The 10th of November 2016, then-President Barack Obama warns newly elected President Donald Trump against hiring Flynn as his national security advisor. November 18, 2016, Mr. Flynn is announced as the next U.S. national security advisor despite major questions over his links to Russia. His role as part of the president's executive office does not require approval from the Senate. During the media feeding frenzy of Russia hacking, on December 29, 2016, Barack Obama announces sanctions expelling 35 Russian diplomats for the alleged interference in the U.S. presidential elections. On the same day, Michael Flynn holds a phone call with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. January 15th, Vice President Mike Pence says on U.S. television network CBS that he spoke to Mr. Flynn about his phone call with the Russian envoy and asserts that it had, quote, nothing whatsoever to do with those sanctions, end quote. Trump and his team, including Flynn, take office on January 20th. On January 26th and 27th, the Justice Department contacts the top White House lawyer and informs him that Flynn may be vulnerable to Russian blackmail. On February 13th, Flynn resigns with a statement, quote, I inadvertently briefed the vice president-elect and others with incomplete information regarding my phone calls with the Russian ambassador, end quote. 
Mr. Flynn, meanwhile, is under investigation for his contacts with the Russian ambassador and his business dealings with Russian and Turkish lobbyists. And since this day, Flynn has left a big stain on the Trump team and honestly cast a shadow of doubt on the trustworthiness of these officials. But did Flynn break the law? Nobody knows exactly what Flynn told Sergei Kislyak if they discussed sanctions or any other deals. But the one thing that is known is that Flynn's conversations were picked up by the U.S. intelligence agencies. His name was then unmasked, which can only be done by high-ranking officials, and then his name was leaked to the news media along with the details of the call. Now, this is actually very illegal and is a felony. Whoever leaked Flynn's name violated his constitutional rights and the standard that if an American citizen is caught up in incidental intelligence collection, that their names not be unmasked or shared. Flynn obviously lied to the vice president and received monies from countries he shouldn't have. His dishonesty to the country and its leader cost him a lot and now he's at the center of a federal investigation into the Trump campaign's ties to Russia. Stay tuned for Russia's supposed ties to the Trump campaign and their alleged hacking of the 2016 presidential election. Part 2 is coming soon. Hey,